So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Will Robinson. I'm the Water Resources and Supply Strategy Manager for Essex and Suffolk Water. Um, we, I'm going to make a, prompt, a fairly prompt start, but we'll give it another couple of minutes just to give a few more people to, uh, to join the call. For those that just joined, I'm just waiting for hopefully some more people to join the webinar and then we'll make a start. Give it one more minute. Um. I think we'll make a start. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as I say, my name is Will Robinson. Uh, I'm the uh, Water Resources and Supply Strategy Manager for Essex and Suffolk Water. Um, so big thank you for, for those that have been able to join us today. Uh, I know everyone's really busy, so that's uh, very much appreciated. Um, so as you know, we're consulting on our draft water resource management plan. Uh, currently and what we'd like to do today is to share with you uh, our plans for how we'll continue to provide resilient water supplies into the future uh, taking account of challenges such as climate change and drought and um, but importantly whilst protecting and enhancing the environment too so making sure our, our operations if you like are sustainable in this in the sense of abstraction particularly so in terms of the running order um, I'm going to talk through our plan um, I'm also pleased to welcome today Daniel Johns um, from Water Resources East, um, who's going to talk uh, about regional water resource planning and put that in the context for uh, uh, our, our own water company plan. Uh, and then at the end of the slides, um, we'll have a question, questions and answer session. Um, so Liz Corbett, who's our water resources team manager, will chair that session. Uh, and we've got all of our technical leads uh, for supply and demand and demand management on the call to be able to answer those questions. Um, so in terms of, of questions, please, you, if you could use the uh, live event Q&A function, uh, which you'll find at the top of the Teams, if it's similar to my screen. Um, and uh, Liz will look at um, those questions and um, and we'll um, agree who's going to answer those at the end. Uh, and then just in terms of the webinar itself, it's being recorded uh, and will be available on requests um, via, by emailing water resources uh, all one word at nwl.co.uk. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, 
So just before I hand over to, to uh, Daniel, I'm just going to give you a little overview about Essex and Suffolk Water. Um, so Essex and Suffolk Water is part of a, a wider group, Northumbrian Water Group, uh, and we operate in East Anglia, in parts of uh, Norfolk, Suffolk and, and Essex and into greater, uh, into greater London. And I've just shared on the screen here what our purpose is, and it's caring for the essential needs of our communities and environment now and for future generations to come. Um, so very, very important looking ahead for future generations, ensuring we've got resilient water supplies that are protecting the environment um, for, for future generations um, and uh, for, for our customers. In terms of our customer base, we're now just over two million customers um, in Suffolk and Essex, with the vast majority of those actually being in Essex, uh, over 1.8 million now. So next slide, please. Just wanted to share the geography of our supply area. So a relatively small water company in comparison to um, in East Anglia in comparison to say Anglian Water. Um, but we operate in, in two distinct areas. So um, on the left, you can see, see the, the two areas in Suffolk out, um, uh, outlined in red. Uh, um, and then one um, further south is our Essex supply area, um, also outlined in red. And Essex is very interesting zone. It's um, predominantly fed by surface water um, and isn't self-sufficient in terms of the amount of water that we need to supply customers. So I've just annotated on the screen there that you can see we've got the EDUs to Essex transfer scheme. So that's um, importing water um, that would otherwise flow out to the wash through the EDU system um, and diverting it through a series of tunnels uh, and via the natural rivers to into the River Stour and into the River um, Blackwater um, to support refill of our Aberton and Hanningfield reservoirs in Essex. But that also is not enough on its own. And um, we have a bulk supply of water from Thames Water bringing in 91 megalitres a day. So already we've been looking at uh, water supply in Essex holistically for many decades now. Um, and uh, um, sharing resources um, in terms of the Thames water, um, but also benefiting from the EU's transfer scheme as well. And on the right, we've got the Suffolk resource, um, water resource zones. There's three of those, Northern Central, which is predominantly surface water fed um, from the Broadland rivers and lakes, um, and then Hartersmere and Blythe, both very rural in nature um, and all supplied with groundwater from the chalk and the crag aquifers. So next slide, please. So that was a little bit of an overview just to set the context and the scene for, for our water resources, if you like. So I'm um, just going to hand over now to Daniel, who's going to talk uh, more about national and regional water resource planning and how that has helped inform our local water resource management plan. So over to you, Daniel. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Will. And uh, thanks for inviting me to speak this morning. I'm delighted to help launch uh, Essex and Suffolk's water resource management plan. Um, I'm Daniel Johns, I'm Managing Director of Water Resources East, and just as by way of introduction, I suppose, to set the kind of national and regional scene for um, regional context for Essex and Suffolk's plan. In uh, March 2020, the government published the, a national framework for water resources, so a kind of national approach to managing scarce water and making sure every part of the country has the water it needs going into, into the long term. And one of the things that the national framework did was it tasked five regional groups to produce a long term water resources plan for all sectors through to 2050 and beyond. And Water Resources East, of course, is the regional planning group that has been tasked to do that for, for the east of England, including the four water company areas within the east, so Anglian Water, Essex and Suffolk. Uh, Cambridge and parts of Affinity Water too. So the national framework also set a number of kind of high level objectives or kind of uh, targets for the water companies and the regional groups to achieve. For example, to reduce household consumption per capita to 110 litres per day by 2050, uh, to reduce leakage by 50% uh, by 2050 compared to 2017, and also set a series of environmental ambitions uh, to return water to the environment in order to safeguard nature and allow the river systems to return to good ecological health. So a set of national targets that drive the regional planning and the regional plan, which then drives the individual water company water resource management plans, Essex and Suffolk being uh, a key one within the east of England. So Water Resources East uh, published its draft regional water resources plan back in November and our consultation closes next month on the 20th of February. So as well as obviously responding to Essex and Suffolk's plan, we'd really appreciate and encourage you to give us feedback uh, to our regional plan that closes next month. 
and we are on the process of finalising that plan based on people's feedback, based on further modelling that we'll do over the spring and summer and hopefully publish our final plan by the end of this calendar year. On the next slide uh, is rather a busy slide, but it tries to summarise in one go exactly what our plan overall says. So this is a kind of one page strategy, I suppose, for the plan we published last November. Because in short, the story is that the amount of water that we need across different sectors within the east of England is going to rise over the next 25 years through to 2050. But the amount of available water, amount of water available for supply is going to decline. And it's going to decline for a number of reasons. For example, the changing climate, changing rainfall patterns and making uh, patterns of rainfall less dependable. We know we need to leave much more water within the environment, so we're no longer able to rely on the sources of water that they have, what we have in previous years. And also we've been tasked by governments, uh, the water companies and the regional groups to deliver greater drought resilience so that uh, instead of kind of severe uh, water use restrictions being imposed one every, once in every 200 years, it's by 2050 or so, rather, sorry, by 2040, those severe drought restrictions shouldn't be imposed any any more frequently than one in 500 years. So that in effect, that also means that water is in as uh, is made even uh, scarcer for the water companies no longer be able to re rely on existing sources of abstraction and new sources of water need to be found. In the uh, middle of the chart on the left hand side, we've we've chopped our plan into kind of five year time slices to illustrate what steps need to be taken to secure water sources, primarily for the public water supply in this case, but also importantly with benefits for all sectors. So we've kind of optimised our plan both to deliver the needs for the public water supply, but with co-benefits for agriculture, for energy, for industry and other water intensive sectors. The plan starts with demand management, more leakage control, kind of smaller schemes in terms of transferring water around the region so it's so it's where it's needed at that point in time. Uh, also smaller and interim supply options kicking in by the late 2020s. But by the time we get into the 2030s, we're into the, some of the major infrastructure schemes that need to be brought online in order to provide that really large amounts of water, uh, returning that large amounts of water back to the environment. And primarily we're talking about reservoir schemes, first of all, so three within our plan in South Lincolnshire, the Fens Reservoir. And I'm sure Will will talk more about the North, North Suffolk scheme as well, which forms a key part of the regional plan. And by the time you get into the late 2030s and into the 2040s, we're talking about potentially four desalination schemes around the Lincolnshire, Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk coastlines. We also have some water reuse schemes, which again, I'm sure Will will explain, is about uh, reusing treated effluent, uh, treating it back into a drinking water standard and providing it back for, for drinking water purposes. So what that does, if the amount of water that we need to find is roughly 600 million litres of water per day um, in order to say safeguard the environment, deliver improved drought resilience, uh, and uh, hopefully allow the environment to, to improve. On the next slide, uh, just shows you the kind of balance of water between um, new sources of water supplies, the bottom uh, half of the chart on the left hand side. So finding about uh, 500 million litres per day through new supply side options. But also can it say demand management is the is the kind of first best approach and is the early part of the regional plan through new, more leakage control, bringing down per capita house, uh, bring, bring, bringing down per capita uh, use in households, uh, rolling out smart metering. Um, and on the right hand side, it shows you how those different options, both demand side in darker blue and the lighter blue supply side options stack up over time to fill that 600 million litres of water per day deficit by 2050, with the large chunk of that supply coming in through the new reservoirs in the mid to late 2030s. The next slide shows that as well as operating at that kind of regional scale for the public water supply, our regional plan does as much as it possibly can to support other sectors water water needs in future. The changing climate, the need to improve the environment applies just as much to farming, to energy and to industry. 
And so we have a much more or a kind of a suite of more detailed projects operating more at a catchment scale to help all sectors improve for the environment. And we're also trying to deliver benefits, not just in terms of water resources, but also water quality and flood risk management. And the little coloured dots show you which of the which which kind of benefits are being delivered by which project. I just wanted to highlight as well as the Norfolk Water Strategy Programme, we have an Essex Water Strategy working closely with Essex and Suffolk Water and with Essex County Council in particular. So that's really looking at the kind of more localised implications of the regional plan and of Essex and Suffolk's plan to see what role the county council has through its planning policies, through its engagement with local communities and households and businesses can help deliver important aspects of the regional and local water resources plans. So if you want to move on to the next slide, uh, yeah, that's it. So, Will, back to you, but I'll be on the call to answer any questions about the regional plan when we get to the end of the stage. Thanks very much. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so now what I'm just going to talk about now is um, um, looking at uh, moving from a regional um, planning context to the, the water company um, plans and what uh, what that process is involved. So starting off very, very early on in the process, um, there was a whole series of expectations that government and our regulators have set. Um, and I won't go through each of these on, on this slide because they're covered in later slides, but uh, I just wanted to say that each of those um, expectations have been translated into a, a WMP, Water Source Management Plan objective for this plan that we have to meet um, in, to, uh, uh, in terms of what we put forward in the, in the final plan. So ne next slide, please. So one of the starting positions for, for our water resource management plan has been all about protecting and enhancing the environment and what, what are we going to do um, to ensure that that, that, that happens. Um, and um, one of the things that you might be familiar with is something known as the Water Industry National Environment Programme or WINEP or WINEP. Um, and that's a programme of works that um, sets out investigations that need to be undertaken to establish whether abstractions, for example, from the environment are sustainable. And if they're not, then what um, interventions need to take place to uh, either provide mitigation or, or, or to reduce that abstraction to more sustainable levels. So those, those abstraction um, sustainability investigations have been completed uh, over the last two to three years um, and um, have concluded for all of our Suffolk ground water um, abstractions that uh, the full license, the amount we could abstract if we wanted to, isn't sustainable. Um, and so in nearly all cases, the licenses are going to be capped from 2030 um, back down to uh, the current level of utilisation. Um, so uh, um, it's important to say um, all, all, also that, but that that will take place in 2030 and that we've uh, allowed for that in forecasting what our supplies are going to be um, um, going, going forwards as well. So I'll come back on to sustainable abstraction in a later slide, but other areas of the environment which we're um, making improvements or protect, looking to protect the environment through our catchment management schemes. Um, we, and we have successful agri capital grant schemes known as the field to tap in place um, where farmers and landowners can apply for grants to help them reduce diffuse losses from their farms um, and to make other wider environmental improvements um, as, as well. Um, a more wider um, holistic water management project is also taking place this five year planning period known as the Blackwater Holistic uh, Water Management Project. And again, as well as delivering water quality improvements, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the catchments, also delivering wider biodiversity uh, Im improvements as well. Um, eel screens has been a big area um, um, for us over the last uh, five to 10 years. And um, actually from 2015 to 2020, we delivered the majority of eel, the eel screens, which were put on our abstraction intakes to prevent us drawing in um, eels into, into our abstraction infrastructure. Um, but we're continuing with that, this AMP as well, and, and there's another couple of schemes to be delivered by, uh, by 2025. And then invas invasive non-native species, another big area that we're working on, um, looking to prevent uh, or at least minimise the risk of transferring invasive non-native species from one river to another or from one reservoir uh, into a river and um, putting in place some control measures such as um, wash down facilities on reservoir sites so that when people bring in boats, for example, um, that um, they're washed down before they go into into our reservoirs and again afterwards so they're not transferring anything out of our reservoir to to other water bodies. 
So that's a little bit of a flavour there of the sorts of things we're doing in this AMP. Um, in this, uh, I should say an AMP is an asset management period and uh, it's a business planning period. Um, uh, and the current one is from 2025 to 2030. Uh, sorry, from 2020 to 2025. So looking forward, though, um, what, what, what do we want to do in the next five year planning period from 2025 to 2030? Uh, and we held some workshops back in July. Um, it was one of the hottest days of the years when we had 40 degrees Celsius, I think. And uh, um, and we had lots of stakeholders come to the um, to to the workshops. They were drop in sessions. So we had people coming and going uh, all day and providing their ideas and where they think we could um, uh, make further improvements in terms of protecting and enhancing the environment. Um, so further work um, to do on abstraction sustainability, um, more catchment management schemes as you'd expect, um, further schemes to increase priority habitat, um, uh, and then importantly, um, I, I'm guessing most people will be familiar with the 25 year environment plan, and so lots of schemes have been proposed um, in terms of um, schemes that will support the objectives of the 25 year environment plan, improving river resilience to, and particularly in relation to, to climate change. So, so lots of really, really, really good ideas, and we've um, uh, scoped those out into specific schemes. And literally this week, we've just finished uploading to the Environment Agency what all of those schemes are for their review uh, and, uh, and approval. Um, so we hope that once we've got those schemes finalised, we'll hold further workshops to share what they are, um, but also present those schemes in our revised draft water resource management plan, which we'll be submitting later on this year. Next slide, please. So we talked about abstraction sustainability briefly, and um, as I say, we're making reductions to our abstraction licenses, capping them back to the current levels of utilisation, which had, um, which have been assessed to be sustainable um, in, in, in the majority of cases. There's one or two licenses that might need to be cut back um, even further. Um, that's based on current conditions, uh, if you like, and um, what we need uh, are also looking at is looking into the future to the 2040s and beyond and thinking, well, what's the climate um, going to be like and then and how much water is the environment going to need to be resilient to climate change and to future growth? Uh, and the Environment Agency, with that in mind, set out a number of scenarios um, and has suggested um, what further reductions to abstraction license quantities are required to ensure that our abstraction licenses are going to be sustainable into the future. Um, there were three scenarios and uh, think of them as a low, medium and high. Um, the, the medium most likely scenario has been um, for further reductions in our abstraction license quantities has been included in our supply forecast for, the, for this plan and is based on that. Um, but there was also an enhanced scenario as well, which would require much more significant reductions. Um, and for example, in Essex would actually result in a loss of deplorable output, loss of water supply uh, or available raw water resources in our Essex um, supply area by about 50% reduction. So it would have a really significant effect. I'll come back to, on to what that might mean uh, in, a, in a later slide. But I think one of the things we recognise is there's a lot of uncertainty about some of these numbers, particularly when you're looking so far ahead in, in the future. And um, so as an industry and with the regional water resource groups, we're going to be undertaking further detailed uh, environmental investigations to look at what the environment might need in, in, in terms of water supply in the future. Uh, and we'll refine those numbers and, we'll, and, uh, and then we'll feed the outcomes into, into our next water resource management plan, which will, will be known as WMP 29 and we'll be submitting that in 2027. So there's a, another opportunity, if you like, to refine the numbers that we've um, we're put into our plan. So next slide, please. So, so what does that all mean really for, for our baseline position? So if we did nothing else and, um, and um, we assumed we got uh, abstraction licenses, albeit they've been capped from 2030 down to, um, to recent utilisation levels. Um, what, what, what does that mean? And, and, it, and it means that we're forecasting a baseline supply deficit in the most extreme drought of, of 43 megalitres of, of water a day um, by 2030. And as I say, that's driven by reductions in our abstraction licences, particularly in Suffolk. Um, it's driven by the use of the latest climate change projections and um, known as, as climate projections 2018 or CP18. And that's again affected our surface water systems more, so in Essex and uh, our, our broadland catchments. 
Um, new non-household demand, particularly in Suffolk again, where we've got lots of increased demand from things like um, energy generation from new um, power stations um, to um, lots of new demand from meat processing plants as, as well. And then finally, um, we're moving to provide a, an enhanced level of resilience. Um, so um, currently, we have levels of service for our um, restrictions on water use and our most extreme restriction um, is known as a level four restriction is actually reductions in pressure or standpipes and rotor cuts which we obviously never had to have um, the level of service that water companies have been required to provide previously is one in 200 years on average but going forwards um, we've been asked to look at in, um, improving that to one in 500 years on average um, and the very latest we can do that by is by 2039 but if you do assume that we have to provide that level of resilience straight away, um, that that does have an impact and contributes to that um, deficit, particularly particularly in Essex. Next slide, please. So because we've got those supply deficits, we it's important that we look at how we're going to manage that. And um, as always, we take a twin track approach in terms of reducing demand in the first instance, uh, and then if necessary, bring on new supplies as well. So this slide, um, I won't talk in detail on this slide because it's covered in future uh, in the following slides, but it just gives an overview of the three tier approach to, um, for demand management that we're proposing. Um, so leakage reduction is really important and we already have um, one of the lowest levels of leakage um, in the industry in the country. Um, Smart, smart metering is another uh, area which we believe we need um, in order to um, reduce customer demand. Uh, and then on top of that, our water efficiency programs. And we believe those three areas will help us achieve the two national targets in, in the green and orange boxes there. So, so that's actually um, an error, I'm afraid, uh, on the green box. It should say a 40% reduction by 2050 um, for our Essex and Suffolk area. There's actually a national target of a 50% um, reduction, um, but I'll come on to why we're going for 40% rather than 50% um, in, in, in the coming slides. And then the PCC target is 110 litres per head per day um, by 2050. So on leakage, um, so just to be very clear, the national target for leakage reduction for the industry is a 50% reduction um, from 2017-18 levels by 2050. Um, but actually, because we already have one of the lowest levels of leakage uh, in the country, um, angling water pipping it as the post at, at that, um, then we, we believe it's not fair for our customers to kind of aim to reduce it by a further 50%. We've already got it down to very low levels, um, which our customers have paid for. Um, and so to be able to reduce it down further, um, we believe um, is, is not fair. Um, but, but also we really think that it's just not achievable either. So for example, if we were to try and reduce leakage in our Suffolk water resource zones, where we have incredibly low levels of leakage um, by 50%, that it just wouldn't be possible um, without replacing nearly all of our mains, which then would become prohibitively um, expensive to do. But nevertheless, 40% is still a really challenging target uh, and, and um, one which we've set out plans about how we're going to deliver that. Um, it builds on our target for reducing leakage by 17.5% by April 2025 as well. Um, and predominantly, the way we're going to do that is by um, increasing our resources for finding and fixing leaks. And there's an old school photo there of some of the, as I say, old school technology that we use for fi um, finding leaks. But what we're wanting to do is to be more innovative um, and deploy something known as acoustic noise loggers um, extensively throughout our network. And um, think of those as very sensitive microphones that literally can listen out for leaks um, and send that information back to our systems um, to allow us to um, find and fix those leaks more quickly. Um, in addition to that, as I say, particularly in Suffolk, where we've got really low levels of leakage already, um, and that's because of historical investment, but also because of the types of soil we have, I mean we get less leaks in, in Suffolk. But in those areas, we're going to have to replace um, some of our mains because that is the only way which we'll be able to get leakage down by 40% uh, overall as a, as, as a business. So that's leakage. Moving on to, to metering. Now, nearly 70% of our customers are already metered. Uh, that means their build, they, um, their water use is measured by a meter and they are um, actually um, billed for their measured water use. 
Um, so we think because of that, um, and also because we're in a serious water stressed area, East Anglia, and because um, uh, uh, because we're forecasting supply deficits, that it's now is the right time and it's fair for all customers to be metered. And so our preferred strategy for metering is a compulsory metering strategy um, with all new, uh, with all customers without a meter having a new smart meter installed. Um, and then also at the same time, all existing um, meters um, will be replaced with smart meters as well. And we plan to do that by 2035 across Essex and Suffolk water as a whole, um, but plan to have all of our Suffolk um, customers smart metered much earlier than that. And if possible, by, by 2030. So again, it's a really stretching target for us um, to bring in that number of meters that quickly um, to, to get all the necessary infrastructure in place to enable the smart meters to, to work. Um, but we think it's the right thing to do. Um, in terms of customer views on metering, then it's not always, uh, as you can imagine, not always a preferred option, um, but we think it is the right one for the reasons I've explained, but also in terms of having a smart meter, um, it's really important in helping us meet our um, PCC target of 110 litres per head per day. So PCC being per capita consumption. Um, so what we think smart meters will help customers do is help them make more informed decisions about their water use. Um, it'll help them identify leaks on their side of the, the, the meter um, and also things like leaky loos. So if you've got a modern day toilet system, um, unfortunately, what we are seeing is, is that they do tend to let water leak from the system into the bowl um, after a good few years, um, but it's not really visible to the eye, and, and but it can add up to a significant amount of water. And uh, we believe our meters are going to pick up on this and help us identify um, where they are and, and, and support our customers in, in getting those fixed. Um, and also with regards to our water efficiency programs, we believe smart meters will help us focus on the high users. So rather than um, uh, um, taking a broad brush approach to where we offer water efficiency um, measures to our customers or support to our customers, we'll focus in more on those customers who are using more, more water. Next slide, please. So again, I think I've really covered um, uh, water efficiency here. So it's, it is about us meeting this national target of 110 litres per head per day by 2050. So we'll have lots of water efficiency program um, programs that will help support customers. Uh, I'll be on the next slide. We'll have the benefits of smart metering and being on a meter will in itself um, bring down customer um, water use. But in order to get down to 110 litres per head per day, we, there are some additional um, interventions at a national level that are required, for example, in relation to white goods labelling. So in the same way as we have um, uh, um, uh, efficiency, um, energy efficiency ratings on, on appliances, we think it's good to have the same um, for water efficiency for things like dishwashers and um, washing machines. And we believe that will help customers make more informed choices uh, about what they purchase. So all of these things together, um, we believe um, are the right things to do. They're strongly supported by our customers in terms of the water efficiency programs uh, and overall should help us get down to that target. So on the next slide, there's just a overview of some of the things that we'll, um, that we'll be looking to do. And um, I'm not going to go into details on that, there's a lot on that slide, but we'll, we'll be circulating these uh, slides after the meeting. And um, so uh, you can take your time in reading those uh, at that point. Next slide, please. So that's, that's the demand management um, schemes which we're proposing and, um, but the demand management on its own is not going to be enough to enable us to supply um, all the forecast demand in the future. Uh, and therefore, we need new supply schemes to be able to do that. So we've undertaken a comprehensive assessment of all options, and we've done that at a regional level with Water Resources East and with the, our neighbouring water companies um, as well, and identified a whole series of options that we've assessed to a, to a certain level. Um, and then we've uh, identified which ones are the least cost schemes for us to implement um, and then which ones are the best value schemes to implement. So the best value takes account of other factors um, such as carbon and um, biodiversity net gain, for example, and, and provides a, a, where we can allocates a, a cost, either a negative or a positive cost to to the scheme costs. And um, ultimately, we've looked at um, what what schemes are best value as well as as, as well as being the cheapest to to deliver. So what we've got on this slide is our, our preferred plan for Suffolk. 
Um, and um, as you can see by the key, the blue the blue boxes are highlighting those which we need to deliver straight away. Um, and the uh, the pink magenta um, boxes are the ones that, that what, one that need to be delivered more on the 2040s, 2045s. Um, so what we've got on here are a new strategic transfer mains um, for, uh, that will allow us to move water between our water resource zones. Um, and um, at either end of those, we've got new strate um, strategic storage for treated water as well, providing extra resilience that way. Um, and that will allow us to use what headroom we do have at it, our tr treatment works to supply um, to supply water to the all three water resource zones. But again, that's not going to be enough on its own. And um, we've got two options which we're looking at that we need to, to deliver, and we need to deliver one of those certainly by 2032. And the first of those is um, lower stuffed reuse. And this is the water reuse schemes that Daniel mentioned earlier on that uh, has been considered more widely throughout the WRE um, region. So in this case, it will take water from Anglian Waters Wastewater Recycling Centre, will be treated um, and um, will be discharged for our new pipeline into the River Waveney um, and uh, circa one mile upstream of our existing abstraction intake and that'll be re-abstracted and treated our existing um, water treatment works. Um, the reason why we've chosen that scheme is because it can be delivered the quickest, um, but actually if we had a choice, we would much rather deliver the North Suffolk Reservoir. And the reason for that is because it allows us to build in much more um, biodiversity gain into the, in, into the reservoir. Um, it's a low carbon option, whereas a reuse scheme is using reverse osmosis technology, which is high energy use. And so overall, we think it's the better long term option to deliver. But at the moment, we think it can't be delivered until 2035. Um, but we are looking at ways, as I'll come into later, as to how we can speed that up and to see if we can deliver it rather than the lowest off reuse scheme. So next slide, please. So for our Essex water resource zone, we're actually um, thinking we, um, we're going to have a, a supply surplus, um, but there is a scheme we want to deliver um, because we can only provide that supply surplus um, under what we're calling a one in 200 drought scenario. Um, and actually we need to be aiming for a one in 500 resilience. So, so the scheme that um, we've got is a new treatment works and chalk abstraction in the South Essex. Um, and we're looking to deliver that now actually in, in terms of moving that moving that forward. We've also got some adaptive pathways in our plan, so alternative futures, if you like. And um, we've got two scenarios. I'll just cover one for now, but um, under a high demand scenario where actually customer demand doesn't come down as we're forecasting, then that could mean we have to develop a new scheme. And the scheme that um, we've selected as our best value plan um, is, is another reuse scheme uh, at South End in this case. And the water there would be eventually discharged into Hanningfield Reservoir, where we have the capacity to treat that water. Next slide, please. So just presenting that um, in a different way. Um, so you can see blue boxes here. Um, and um, we've got the schemes which we want to deliver by 2030, the, low, the lowest off reuse scheme we want to deliver by 2032, um, and our demand management options. And they're all outlined in red, and that's because they're known as our core plan. They're the absolute no regrets um, uh, schemes that we want to deliver in order to provide resilient water supplies. Um, and um, further on, um, we've, um, we've got our wider best value plan that considers further abstraction reductions in the future, so reductions to abstraction licenses, and they in themselves could cause supply deficits and needs uh, and require us to develop new schemes. And the schemes that have been uh, that would be needed would be a new reuse scheme in Suffolk um, and and eventually the North Suffolk Winter Storage Reservoir in any case. Um, but as I say, um, we want to consider whether we can build the North Suffolk Reservoir first instead of the lowest off reuse. So next slide, please. So what we've got is a, what we call an adaptive pathway. And um, the left, very left-hand box is saying that we're going to undertake further detailed design, um, looking at all of these different schemes. And our plan is to have them all construction ready by 2020, the end of 2026. And that's our review point. And at that point, we'll then say, which is our best value plan now after all? 
And if it's still low stuff free use, then we'll continue to deliver that. But actually, if we can deliver the North Suffolk Reservoir sooner, then we will um, move across to the green adaptive pathway instead and, and deliver the reservoir first. Um, other than that, the rest of the plan is um, pretty similar. So that's the supply and demand elements of our plan that we're proposing uh, and consulting on. Um, just wanted to share with you our levels of service, our planned levels of service um, from 2025. So um, we have four, four different restrictions on water use during drought, and this is what these levels of service um, apply to. Um, the first is appeal for restraint. The second is a temporary use ban or a host pipe ban, as some people might be aware, uh, know them as. Uh, Non-essential use ban through a drought order. And then the, the very the most severe restriction is reduced supply at customer tap. And as I say, that could be um, stand pipes and, and, and rotor cuts. Um, now we've got the, and the next column, we've got the, um, the current levels of service that we provide. And as you can see for the levels and one, level one and two um, restrictions, that's one in 10 years and one in 20 years respect, respectively. But actually because of the position we're finding ourselves now in with um, um, needing to develop new, new supplies, then we're needing to reduce those levels of service to one in five years for an appeal for restraint and one in 10 years for a temporary use ban. And then, as I say, for the level four restrictions, um, we're currently going to be one in 200 years from 2025 to 2032. Um, but 2032 at the earliest, we'll then move to one in 500. Um, we'll do that as soon as we've got the new supply schemes delivered. So it might be a little bit later um, uh, uh, if that turns out to be the case. Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, there's lots of assumptions in water resource planning and um, what we've undertaken is a stress testing or sensitivity analysis. And um, for lots of different aspects of the plan, whether that be on the supply side or demand forecast side, we've used what we call low, medium and high scenarios. And the medium scenario is a, is a central scenario that's the most likely to happen. And all of our plans are based on using this medium most likely scenario. However, we've also looked at low and high scenarios as well to see actually in the case of demand, if it doesn't come down as quickly as we'd like it to, um, does that cause us problems? And likewise with environmental destination, if we have much bigger sustainability reductions applied to our abstraction licenses in the future in the 2040s, um, will that cause deficits as well? So as you can see, in terms of demands and environmental destination, that does cause supply deficits. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, the plan that we're proposing to put forward is an adaptive plan. So not only will it have the adaptive pathway for the North Suffolk Reservoir, but it will also have one um, for demand um, and environmental destination as well. So I'll just um, move on to the next slide and just show you what, you, what that means. So this one is for the enhanced scenario for environmental destination. And in our plan, we actually call this scenario our best um, plan for the environment as well. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, what, what that happens it has a really big impact on our Essex water resource zone, on our Essex supply area. And um, we, we lose on the enhanced scenario well over 50% of our deplorable output. And as a consequence of that, the best value scheme um, that, that would be needed would be a new desalination plant, um, potentially in the Canvey Island area, but there were other options um, as well, uh, available as well. And um, that being the case, that would be an extremely large, expensive scheme that was approaching one billion pounds in terms of the capital investment um, that would be required to deliver that. So clearly, it's really important that we get this right in terms of our understanding of what future reductions and abstraction license are required um, because of the implications it would have um, to customer bills. Um, but also in terms of from an environmental perspective, you know, really, I don't think we want to be delivering high energy desalination plants that have wider environmental aspects to consider as well. So that's the scenario that would be re required for the enhanced environmental destination. And then there's also an adaptive pathway um, um, for, um, for high demand scenario. Next slide, please. So as I say, the high demand scenario is where um, uh, per capita consumption, customer demand doesn't come down as quickly as we'd like it to. Um, and that's one aspect of the high demand scenario. Um, and in this case, that, that requires a new reuse scheme. So again, we'll keep this under review all of the time. 
will continue to develop the reuse scheme so that if we do need to deliver it, then we're going to be ready to be able to do that. So just wanted to just return to the um, government expectations and our own WMP objectives that we've set ourselves. So just we'll go through these one by one. Um, so to achieve a secure, resilient and sustainable supply of water for our customers, uh, moving to one in five, 500 of resilience by 2040. So uh, we, we are planning on that basis and we'll um, um, should be able to achieve that level of service earlier than 2039, 40. Um, and indeed, it'll be somewhere hopefully between 2032 and 2035. Um, protect and enhance the environment, ensuring our abstractions are sustainable both in the short and long term. Absolutely, you know, hopefully we've covered today that our abstraction licenses will be um, capped uh, and there may well in the longer term, but the need to cap them even further. Um, and that's all hardwired into our supply forecasts, if you like, as well. Um, so there's this national target for leakage to reduce leakage. Um, um, so contributing to a national target to reducing leakage by 50% by 2050. <clears throat> so as I've explained throughout, we absolutely will be contributing to that, but we don't believe 50% is appropriate for us, um, given our excellent leakage performance already, and that a 40% reduction um, is more appropriate and affordable as well. <clears throat> um, we've signed up to the 110 litres per head per day um, PCC target uh, and, and put in place demand management plans to enable us to achieve that and compulsory smart metering as well as our water efficiency campaigns uh, are critical for that. Um, not only have we considered compulsory metering, that is in our in our in our plan. Uh, as our smart meters, uh, climate change is very much in, um, an integral part of our water supply forecasts. And as I said, we've used the latest climate change projections to see how rainfall will be impacted, how that will affect river flows and how that will affect recharge of our aquifers and refill of our reservoirs and how that ultimately affects the deplorable output of our of our system. Um, and again, that last point is referring back to um, uh, unsustainable abstraction and again, in the short term, the commitment to cap our licences in 2030. So we feel as though we've met all the government expectations for our plan um and um and, and uh essentially that's what we've submitted to defra and are consulting on um right now so next slide please so that's an overview of our plan um um and um hopefully you've got some questions about the plan that, and we'll, we'll look to answer those um um shortly in terms of the consultation um it's really um important that we get as much feedback from uh, all stakeholders um, and our customers, as well as as well as from our regulators. Um, and as I say, the consultation is ongoing. Um, if you uh, you can access it from two websites, there's our customer facing website um, eswater.co.uk, and there's a link on the homepage. Um, or there's our group website nwg.co.uk forward slash wmp is the the shortcut to 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 the to the landing page and. Uh, and there's uh, the, there's the ESW draft water resource management plan consultation on that page. So any consultation responses that you would like to make um, need to be made by the 29th of March this year. And importantly, they need to be sent to DEFRA. But what we'd also ask is that you send them to us as well um, and um, um, send them to waterresources at nwl.co.uk. And then just very quickly, as, as Daniel um, said, uh, just a reminder that the WRE consultation is also ongoing. Uh, it closes a little bit earlier because it started a little bit earlier than um, to coincide with all the other regional plan consultations. It closes on the 20th of February. Um, I've got the link on the page there for you to be able to access the consultation documents also. So next page, please. And I think this is our final slide. And what, what I'm really keen um, to hear your views on We'd like to hear any of your views, uh, and um, but the things we'd really li um, like to, to hear about is whether you support our adaptive plan for the North Suffolk Reservoir. Do, do you also think it's the, the preferable scheme to go for, um, particularly from an environmental and sustainability perspective? Um, do you support our target to reduce total leakage um, from our network by 40% by 2050? Um, do you support our preferred plan to compulsory meter all customers using smart meters? Um, and then finally, do you support our environmental ambition to reduce abstraction from existing sources to lower levels? 
So as I say, we're definitely going to be making license caps to our abstraction licenses in 2030. That's that's built in to the plan. Um, what, what we need to decide is what, what level of environmental ambition we go for later 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 on. And um, as I say, the, the the further investigations that we'll undertake at a regional level will help inform that process. Next page, please. So just to end up on, so we, we've got our webinar today. Um, the consultation ends um, in March. Um, it's worth saying we've also got further webinars that we're, we're hosting. So we have another webinar with all local planning authorities, for example, this afternoon. Um, and um, and then importantly, what we need to do as soon as we get everybody's um, responses in um, is create what's known as a consultation statement of response. Um, and we'll address each of those individually and say whether we support the view and if so, we'll make amendments to our plan and or if we don't support it and no changes will be made to to, to our plan. Um, but either way, that'll be documented in this statement response and there's a deadline in June where we will have to publish that um, on our website and submit that to DEFRA. Uh, and at the same time, we'll email everybody, all of our stakeholders to, to let them know that it's gone onto, onto the website as well. And then at the very latest, we're looking to publish our revised draft WMP, which takes account of the consultation. Um, and we'll publish that again on our website at this point, no later than October, but it's likely that actually we'll publish that um, at an earlier date. So I think that's the last slide and we'll move now on to um, questions and answers uh, session. So I'll hand over to Liz. Thanks, Will. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we've just had two questions in, so there is still time. Um, just pop them in the, the Q&A there and we'll, uh, um, we've got plenty of time to, to answer them now. Um, the first one um, was, uh, can you force customers to have a smart meter? Gary, do you want to carry, cover that one? Thanks, Liz. Um, so as Will uh, has said throughout the presentation that we are encouraged to consider compulsory metering for water stressed areas, which both Suffolk and Essex are in the next amp going forward. Um, so if the water resource management plan is approved, then compulsory metering becomes a legal requirement and therefore we don't need approval from customers. However, we recognise that customer engagement is really, really important. We also recognise that not all customers are going to be better off by switching to a meter. And therefore, we're currently considering a, a raft of support interventions to ensure that we can provide the best possible service for those customers. So that includes making sure that where possible, we install the meter externally. And therefore, that's a low effort for the customer and low impact. We're looking at tariffs to make sure that we can support our customers in terms of their varied needs. We're looking at how long it is before we force a customer to switch to a metered bill and the frequency of billing. Um, and we're looking at other support options in terms of consumption reduction. So this goes hand in hand with water efficiency support and interventions. Thanks, Gary. Um, the second question, uh, we've got one more. We'll just publish that. Um, so the second question from Graham was, um, are the reductions in levels of uh, one and two service, uh, levels of service expected to be permanent or temporary until new supply options have, have come in? So um, I'm happy to cover that one. Um, well, unless, Will, you want to? Uh, you go for it, Liz, that's fine. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, it, it's just a temporary measure. Um, we are actually developing um, uh, one of our groundwater sources in the London boroughs um, that uh, we currently have uh, and we're building a new treatment works there. Um, uh, it's something we need to um, to do for other reasons as well. It's an artesian groundwater source. Um, so to help with um, flooding, alleviating local flooding, we're going to actually bring that back into water supply. Um, we also have um, a, a water sharing agreement with Thames Water currently to share some of our surplus that we identified in our previous WRMP 19. Um, that finishes um, in uh, 2030. Uh, so once um, that agreement finishes, then um, we'll be able to revert our levels of service to our planned levels of service. So just a temporary measure. Um, OK, the uh, third question, um, what impact uh, will this plan have on customer bills? So Crawford, if you're able to cover that one for us, please. 
Yes, I mean, it, it, it's still early days and officially we should wait until uh, the business plan in September to, to confirm this. But um, you're talking about 10 to 20 percent uh, or impact of uh, in the next uh, 25 to 30 uh, bills. Uh, but that's not a forecast of the bills because other things take the bills in other directions. So that it might not be as much of that as that when other things take into effect. But you're talking about 10 to 20 percent because of these investments. Real terms. Great, thank you, Corfid. Um, next question, uh, what has the response been to smart meter trials that we've carried out so far? Gary. Yeah, Fab, so we have installed uh, just over 20,000 smart meters connected to a smart network in and around Dagenham in Essex. Um, quite a lot of engagement with the customers, um, very positive response in terms of their perceptions of smart more so about the value it adds to them in terms of transparency and trust. So allowing them to visualise their consumption to understand the relative impact that's going to have on their bill to try and mitigate bill shock, but more importantly, to allow them to take control of their consumption and reduce it. So very positive so far. Um, we're not forcing customers to switch to a metered bill in our trials in Essex and Suffolk at the moment, but we are seeing quite a significant number of customers take up that option. Thanks, Gary. OK, um, and this is any last questions. Um, I'll hand back over to Will. That's great. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, so thanks everyone for your time this morning. Um, what I would say is this is a this is not a one uh, one opportunity and we'll continue to engage with all of our stakeholders um, and um, almost certainly have some additional webinars in the future when we've once we've updated and revised our draft plan. Uh, taking account of all the consultation responses um, and um, but yeah please please do um, uh, please do get your responses in and um, and we'll keep everyone informed as with the progress we make uh, that we make over the over the coming weeks and months um, so yeah if you do have any other questions that you'd need to ask directly to us um, please feel free to do that via the water resources at nwl.co.uk email address uh, or give me a ring if you have my phone number and we'll absolutely be happy to answer those directly um, as well. So, yeah, once again, thanks very much for your time today and for everyone on the call today. And uh, what we'll do, I think, is we'll um, share this recording with all of our stakeholders um, directly um, rather than um, rather than people having to request it. So we'll proactively do that. So um, once again, thank you and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.